a whole month on one topic. But it's easy because the personality who we're going to be speaking about is such a glorious personality with so many dimensions and depths and features of his, his gift to the world. You see on the screen. For those of you that are over there, can you see the screen? That thing's not blocking it? The backdrop is blocking it? You can see, more or less. Okay. Later this month will be the anniversary, 150th anniversary of his appearance. And some of you may know there has already been a celebration in India with Modi presiding over the function for two hours from the Gaudiya Mat. I'm not sure exactly where it was held, but some big fancy hall. And most of it was in Bengali, which I don't understand. And so I forwarded to some Bengali speaking people. And Modi spoke in Hindi, which I also don't understand. But if you get a chance to view that, at least you could hear what he said. Modi. He's a um, wonderful glorification of Bhakti Siddhanta by some very eminent present personalities in, in this world. Here you see a, a photograph certainly looks like he is posing for the photograph, standing in very simple sannyas attire with his sannyas danda. And he didn't live a very long life, 63 years almost, about one month short of 63. And let us begin just some glorification of Bhakti Siddhanta. One of the biographies of his life is called the Ray of Vishnu. And the name Ray of Vishnu was given because his father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, was reviving the lineage of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when it had kind of diminished and because it had kind of diminished there were deviations within his sampradaya and so many other things that were the spirituality from Gaudiya Vaishnavism wasn't strong at that time so very vigorously he was trying to bring it to life again and succeeded but he was feeling inadequate. Advanced Vaishnavas often feel like that. He was a grahasta. He had 10 children, 10 children. Some of you have two children, one child, 10 children. Imagine what that was like. And one of those children was a child that he prayed for, that he prayed for a ray of Vishnu to help him bring the Chaitanya mission back to life. And when this child, Bhimal Prasad, was given the name from birth, when he was born, it was a little unusual, wrapped over his shoulder and around his neck, just like a Brahmin's thread was his umbilical cord. And Bhakti Minod Thakur took this as a sign. This is the, that ray of Vishnu that I was praying for. And at this time, he was born in Puri because 
His father, Bhaktivedo Thakur, had a very unusual life situation. Unusual in the sense that the British did not appoint indigenous people into high positions. They appointed British people into high positions to keep control of the country. But they saw such qualification in Bhaktivinoda Thakur that he was appointed the um, in, in charge of the the uh, I don't know that the title is Chief Justice Magistrate. That's the British term, magistrate. So he was the, the, the judge, high court judge, the magistrate in Puri, which is a very important place. And because he had that post, he had a residence that was right along Grand Road. Now, if you've been to Puri, you know what, what Grand Road means. It's the, the road upon which the Rathiyatra procession occurs every year. Over on this end is the main temple, the Jagannath Temple. And over on the far end of Grand Road is the, the Gundicha Temple, the place where Jagannath was taken to in that procession for Rathiyatra. And in between, halfway in between, was where Bhaktivinoda Thakur's house was. So that one particular year, the year that Bhakti Siddhanta was born, the cart stopped right in front of his house. And what do you do when Jagannath doesn't want to go anywhere? You, you don't go anywhere. They pulled, but he didn't want to go anywhere, so he stayed there for a while. And because his wife... Bhaktivinoda Thakur's wife, he had privileges, therefore she had privileges. She, Bhagavati Devi, she brought the child right up onto the cart and placed the child right before the deity of Lord Jagannath. And as she placed the child before the deity of Lord Jagannath, a garland slipped from his neck and circled around the child. So he took that as confirmation. This is the ray of Vishnu that I was hoping for. Interwoven with the childhood and the adult life of Bhakti Siddhanta was his father. He was very, very close to his father and had the highest regard for his father. And his father taught him and took care of him in so many wonderful devotional ways. In before Bhaktivinoda Thakur got to Puri, he was around 36 years of age, and at that young age, he was already a very renowned spokesperson on behalf of Vedic culture. He gave a, a lecture in Didna, Dinajpur, 1869, with an assembly of highly learned and influential scholars and religionists and historians and so forth and so on. And he, his topic was speaking about the Srimad Bhagavatam. So it was a, it was a lecture that later was, that it later became a publication. That's kind of what scholars do. They speak on a topic they have a paper that goes with the topic, and later it may be that the paper becomes a booklet or a publication of some kind. And that was the, that was the scholarly tradition that Bhaktivinoda followed, and so he spoke on the Bhagavat, its philosophy, its ethics, and its theology. And the theme was the glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the sub set purposes were to deal with the orthodox Hinduism, which Prabhupada didn't like that word at all, 
but the orthodoxy of people that call themselves followers of the Vedas and how it had flaws, not that the scripture had, the Vedic scripture has flaws, but the application of it was flawed. And then there, during that, his period of time, there was a samaj, a group of religious people that went by the name, the Brahmo Samaj, and he was in this lecture pointing out the flaws in their whole approach and putting in his place the Srimad Bhagavatam. That was his message. And uh, following his father many years later, about 60 years later, uh, his son gave a similar t talk, uh, 1933. You know, the language is a little more stiff. They don to its morphology and ontology. You may have to have a dictionary to look up to see what all of that means. Ontology and morphology. And later, that also became a book. The Vedanta, it's morphology and ontology. You look at the center of that publication and you'll see the logo of a Gaudiya Mat. So this means in 1933, Bhakti Siddhanta had already formalized the mission, the Chaitanya mission, called it Gaudiya Mat. And we're going to take a closer look at what that logo is. And interestingly, Back to Godhead magazine published this book in 1969 in the Back to Godhead magazine. So it's not a book, it's a booklet. It's several pages long. And that became an, um, the feature article of Back to Godhead magazine in 1969. I'm making a point of this because this was the first Krishna conscious literature that I received as a young college kid. I didn't know what Hare Krishna movement was at all. I didn't know nothing about nothing. And I had a friend who did. And he didn't tell me what, what Hare Krishna was. He just, one time we were having lunch together and he gave me Back to Godhead magazine. I didn't know what it was. I didn't read it. I carried it around with me because it was a gift and I thought, you know, that was nice. But after some days passed and it was in my stack of books along with my clipboard and things like that. And another person I know saw the Back to Godhead magazine and looked at me and said, oh no, you're not into that, are you? I said, what's that? He said, well, you don't want to be into that. They didn't even say what it was they shouldn't be into. So it got me curious enough to read the magazine. And when I read the magazine, long story short, it took about three hours because the language was really high. I had to have a dictionary by my side and every 10th word I had to look it up and underline it and write in the margin of the magazine and what, it, what the meaning was. And at the end, I reached two conclusions. I don't know what I read because it was so high. I mean, the philosophy and the language together was very high. But the second thing was I found myself in a place of consciousness that I had never known before. Meaning just these words, written words of Bhakti Siddhanta were so powerful. And to this day, including today, I have the highest regard for Bhakti Siddhanta. In that Back to Godhead magazine, Vedanta, its morphology and ontology, helped me become a devotee. Significant help. So look in the center of that publication. Here's the logo for the Gaudiya Math in Bengali, and in case you don't read Bengali, here's what it says in English. 
And in the center is the holy name. And surrounding the, four, the holy name are the six opulences of Bhagavan. And then on the left side, looking at the logo, you want me to make it closer? Is that better? Okay. On the left side of the logo, you see Lakshmi Narayan, deity. And on the right side, you see Radha Krishna under a tree. It's representing the Vidhi Mark on the left side and Raga Mark. Those Vidhi Sadhana Bhakti, Sadhana that follows the Vidhis, includes deity worship, so that below is Archana, and Pancharatra. This is followers of Lord Chaitanya, who's at the very top. Their standards and procedures, etc., of deity worship comes from the Pancharatra, specifically Narada Pancharatra and others. And this, on the right side is Srimad Bhagavatam, just like his father's topic, the Bhagavat, its philosophy, its ethics, and so forth. So Bhagavatam, and at the bottom uh, right is Kirtan. So Archana and Kirtan go together with the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And easily recognizable is a Radanga. But what's that thing that's above the Radanga? Take a look. It's a printing press. Bhakti Siddhanta was fond of saying, and Prabhupada repeated it, the Mridanga can be heard for several blocks, but the printing press can be heard around the world. During Bhakti Siddhanta's time, Communism became very popular in Bengal. And it became popular in Bengal through the medium of printed literature. There were other things that were done, but the, one of the strongest influences to take something that was obscure during that period of time and make it very prominent was printing and publication and distribution of printed material. So Bhakti Siddhanta picked up that principle. Srila Prabhupada picked up that principle. And it was a very prominent part of the Gaudiya mission to have a printing press. Not one, a printing press, many printing presses. Historically, Srila Prabhupada picked up on the same principle. I'll just share this. This, this is appreciation of Prabhupada being a follower of Bhakti Siddhanta. Saraswati Thakur. One of the things that he wanted was a printing press. So, although we didn't have much of anything, he requested the devotees to buy a printing press and run a printing press. But nobody knew how to run a printing press except one. The devotee's name was Gadadhar. He was in New York, and so he went to where the printing press was. And ran the printing press. They had somebody else that really didn't know how to operate the printing press properly. But prior to that, th anyway, printing literature, offset printing was practice prior. That means you act, literally set up the letters and then once you set up the letters, you crank the machine and it sends the paper through the machine and it stamps the paper with ink and offset printing, and often the, the letters were a different height. Mm -hmm. wasn't digital like the modern system. Anyway, all of that is detail. The path of Ragamarg includes the Kirtan, Bhagavatam, and printed literature. And then the Vidhi portion is the deity worship portion. And at the top is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, at the bottom is Guru and Gaudiya. 
the representative of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the form of the spiritual master, and that's the logo. It's involved, logo, but it was on all of his publications. And he stood by it. So now a little bit of his character. One time, when his father was worshipping a deity of Krishna at home, the little boy, Bhimal Prasad, three years old, saw a mango, and he ate the mango. And his father mildly admonished him. Oh, you've eaten the mango before it was offered to Krishna. This is not good. So a three-year-old boy took a vow for the rest of my life. I'm an offender. For the rest of my life, I'll not eat mango. And those of you that know about mango season in Bengal, that's, that's a pretty severe vow. And for the rest of his life, he up upheld that three-year-old child's vow. Later, when he's the Acharya of the Gaudiya Math, they offered him mango, and he would say the same thing. No, I'm an offender. I can't accept my mango. Just see, it's from childhood. When he was seven years old, his father gave him a deity. This is the Kurma deity, or a photo of the Kurma deity. And it was reciprocation for his strong spiritual acumen. He had memorized the entire Bhagavad Gita at seven. I'm pausing because that's really... Some of you have children, and if your children know some slokas, that's really nice. And they have their favorite ones, and they can recite them. But I don't know any child that's seven years old that can recite the entire Bhagavad Gita from memory. But they're not Bhaktisiddhanta either. When he was 13, he received another deity. This is a photograph of that other deity. Nishinga deity, Nishinga mantra, and Maha mantra, and Japa beads. Now, it's not that he didn't chant before he was 13, but it wasn't like an informal diksha of his son at 13. And he was super scholarly. Super scholarly. And so much so that he put two and two together and understood most young men, when they finish their academic life, there's some expectation of them. Get a job, get married, have children, and do all of that. So he saw where this one was going, and so he decided to not complete his education, formal education, and instead he became a librarian of a king. And he did that for 11 years. That doesn't mean he didn't do anything else, but here's a king of Tripura who... Um, looks a little bit even younger than Bhakti Siddhanta. But Bhakti Siddhanta was living that lifestyle where he was doing his writing and doing his research and doing his brahminical activity uh, from that position. And his father was, was fine with that because he understood the nature of his son. Then one very significant event took place where his, he was spending time visiting his father or being with his father in Puri. And in Puri at that time, there was a Babaji, very celebrated, charismatic kind of personality named Radha Ramana Charana Das Babaji. And he was a celebrity very respected and 
learned and, you know, charismatic personality. However, he had some practices that Bhakti Siddhanta took exception to. Two of them. One of them was he invented his own mantra. He t- made his bhajan kutir right next to, approximate to, the samadhi of Haridas Thakur. The samadhi of Haridas Thakur is in Puri, near the beach, and he set up his bhajan kutir next to Haridas Thakur's samadhi, and rather than chanting Hare Krishna, Maha Mantra, he invented a different mantra. I can tell you what the mantra is, but it's, it's it, Bhakti Siddhanta took exception to it because, in his words, it's conflict of rasa, rasa abhas. So it's not it's not an appropriate mantra. The names of God are fine, but this particular mantra is rasa bas. And then the second practice that he had taken up which Bhakti Siddhanta took exception to, was a practice called Saki Beki. We all know the name Saki. Sakis are the young gopis. The assistants of the Manjaris are Sakis. Manjaris are assistants of the gopis, and Sakis are female associates who assist them all. So he had a disciple, a male disciple, who he had him dress up as a gopi or a saki, and he was pra- having him practice becoming, in his spiritual form, an assistant of the gopis, saki beki. And it was, you know, he was a popular fellow, and so others were starting to imitate what he was doing. And this irritated Bhakti Siddhanta so much that he confronted him one day and blasted him because he was known throughout his life as a, 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 a he was a confrontational type of personality. He wasn't just like bash people, but when he saw deviations, he wouldn't be, remain silent. And he would speak strongly and he would explain why it was wrong and what was proper. It's, it's that the, the approach that his father had was the approach of humble persuasion, just like this Bhagavat, its philosophy, its ethics, and so on. For in front of a, a group of very scholarly people, and he was just giving, he was doing the same thing, but the, the mood was the humble persuasion mood. And Bhakti Siddhanta, his son, was confrontation. It is said when Bhakti Siddhanta would be walking along the street and some deviant person <laughs> was coming the other direction, he'd go on the other side of the street because he didn't want to face him. Because he's Nishinga Guru, he would speak strongly. He wouldn't hold back. So he confronted this Babaji with both of these practices. And it created a big uproar in Puri because here's this young fellow and this older Babaji that everyone knew and had high regard for, and there's this big conflict. It became such a commotion that his father, Bhakti Thakur, said, you were right, but it created such a turmoil. I think you should leave Puri, go to the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Mayapur, and just chant Hare Krishna and be happy. So that's what he did. From 1905 until 1914, starting at around 31 years of age, he went to the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Yogpith, and later he shifted to 
Another place, a grass hut, was, was, was his residence. And then eventually at the um, house of Chandrasekhar Acharya, Chandrasekhar Acharya during Mahaprabhu's time was an exalted grahasta devotee and his residence was the now headquarters of Bhakti Siddhanta's Gaudiyamath, Chaitanya Gaudiyamath. So where his home was, he also established a little cottage. And what you see in the photograph is a recent photograph. It's where that cottage was, they eventually made like a shrine, marble enclosed, etc. And inside, he chanted, he, took a, he had taken a vow, this Namavrata was that he would chant one billion names. And to chant one billion names, he did the math. Oh, by the way, before all of this happened, during his college days, Bhakti Siddhanta was a reputed astrologer. He was good at math and good at astrology. And he, he wrote an explanation of Surya Siddhanta. And it's in Bengali, now it's available in English, and it's, it's, a, it's a text, very elevated text, very detailed text. He was known in India at the time as the most accomplished astrologer, but he gave it up. I think it's just, it's on the material platform and I'm not interested. He just left it behind. So, three times 64 rounds a day. The same number of rounds per day that Haridas Thakur chanted, which is superhuman. To chant three times 64 rounds a day, that, may, that means if he chanted five minute rounds, I don't know how long it takes all of you to chant Japa, but I can't do that. There's, a, there's this nice digital recording of Prabhupada chanting Japa, and it's just about seven minutes, and I, it's a challenge to keep up with it. Seven minutes per round. It's, it's doable. Certainly doable. But five minutes per round? For 16 hours a day? For nine years, very intense, and he completed so that he made a vow and he completed his vow, just like he would eat mango. He just he he made a vow. He kept his vow. It, what this is what's inside that shrine. He during this time he was also writing, and the beginning of establishing the Gaudiya Mat and the, the, the systems or the 64 different centers of Gaudiya Mat. He had a vision which Prabhupada followed and established ISKCON in the wake of the Gaudiya Mat in its likeness. But the in international movement. Now there's... <clears throat> In the place that eventually became his headquarters, he was wanting to have deities. And there's two different versions of the, the history of how these deities came to him. Here's the deities of Gandharvika Giridhari. Gandharvika Giridhari Ki. Uh, those of you who have been to Mayapur, you've seen these deities. They're very strong, powerful deities. The temple worship area is simple, but the, the, the deity worship is very, very nice. And it, as is done in some places, just like on our altar, there's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the standard for having Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by the side of Radha Krishna deity was established by Bhakti Siddhanta and followed. Some of you know who Janani Vas is. He's the head pujari for umpteen years, for, for several decades in Mayapur. And he has 
a slightly different version than the one that I am familiar with. Uh, Bhakti Siddhanta wanted to establish this headquarters, the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math. And he wanted deities. So he went with some devotees to Jaipur to purchase deities. And they went to a particular deity carver, and as they approached the deity carver, the Murti seller said, over there are your deities. And Bhakti Siddhanta's reply was, how do you know these are my deities? And the vendor said, last night I had a dream. These deities came to me in a dream and said, tomorrow a Mahapurusha will come here and will want to buy deities from you. I want, to, I want him to serve us. So please take them. I want to give them to you. So Bhakti Siddhanta accepted the gift. And Gandharvaka Giri Dari were installed the same day that he accepted the order of sannyas. There's a different version that's similar, but it's nice to know. A learned person at the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math tells it slightly differently. He gives the same years of this vrata, but after the completion of this Nama Vrata, Bhakti Siddhanta wanted to establish the Gaudiya Math. Same, so the beginning is the same. He went with some devotees to Jaipur. In one of the shops he went in Jaipur, he had an attraction for these particular deities, and the Murti maker said, no, I can't sell the deities to you because they're already sold. They're promised to somebody. And so he went away. And that evening, Bhakti Siddhanta had a dream, and the same deities appeared in his dream instructed him that he should go back to the same shopkeeper that said, I can't give you the deities because they're already sold to somebody and ask him for the deities because I want you to worship me. So he went back and told the dream to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper said, okay, they're your deities. And so there they are. This is the, the date when he took sannyas the date when these deities were installed and the formal uh, beginning of the Gaudiya mission. And Bhakti Siddhanta was very dynamic. Certainly, of course, very prominent was printing and distribution of literature. So he wrote profusely and those profuse writings were printed and distributed widely. And it's very similar to what Srila Prabhupada did following Bhakti Siddhanta. He engaged his disciples in distributing literature and giving the message. But one of the, the, the systems that he had was not just giving the message, but training devotees because he understood that in this age of Kali, people need, to tra they need training. They need teachers to train them. And so one of the ways that he trained was in those, these temples, Gaudiya temples, but also a system that he used was writing. There, there are th three of the several publications that are just collections of his teachings or instructions to disciples. And, and next week we're going to go through some of those, but they're very profound. He was an innovator based upon the principles of Rupa Goswami. One of those principles of Rupa Goswami, just like with the printing press, is Yukta Vairagya. Yukta means engagement, and Vairagya means detachment. So you, the principle is detachment results from engaging things in service to Krishna, like a printing press. It wasn't for making money, it was for propagating the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That was his mission. And so he engaged a printing press. 
and he engaged disciples going distant places in conveyances like airplanes, which was taboo for renunciates, but for spreading the message of Krishna consciousness, yukta vairagya, not for sense gratification, but for the purpose of spreading Krishna consciousness. One of the things he did just to make his statement, give you a clear picture, this is in Vrindavan. Now, and aside from stitched clothing, which sannyasis aren't supposed to do, uh, conveyances, palanquins and chariots, what to speak of cars, what to speak of convertibles. I mean, who, who even knew what a convertible was during Bhakti Siddhanta's time, but he had one. And he would ride through the streets of Vrindavan, waving at people, indicating everything can be used in Krishna's service. Not for sense gratification, but for Krishna's service. This, was, this is an example of a principle that he lived by. And, of course, when you're engaging something in Krishna's service, you have to be very careful. Because something, can, something else can happen easily. You can be engaged by that something, rather than you're engaging that something. You can become attached to the something rather than it becomes an opportunity to serve Krishna in a different way. There's risks involved in yukta vairagya or engaging things in Krishna's service. Just like having a, a nice temple like this. It's nice. It should be a nice temple for the deities and for the, so many people to come and you know, air conditioning in the summer and heating in the winter and nice lighting and digital TV screens and, you know. One can become the enjoyer of the facilities rather than offering the facilities unto Krishna in his service. But he was already incredibly renounced that that had been demonstrated already. He was, he was on a platform that was beyond the Varna and Ashram platform. His whole life, he was Naishtika Brahmachari. His whole life. And <clears throat> yet he took sannyas, although he was beyond the Varnas and Ashrams, he took sannyas for a purpose, for preaching. How his, his system of taking sannyas was very incredible. It was kind of radical, in fact. He, he sat before a picture of Gorkishore Das Babaji, and he, he took his sannyas vows before the photograph of Gorkishore Das Babaji and received the mantras and kept his sannyas vows and the sannyas mantras and everything. It's, it, a very special personality, not to be imitated type of personality. His lifestyle was on the one hand very simple, like we see here, and on the other hand he could dress very elaborately and ornately in turbans and nice attire, according to the occasion and purpose. When, during these 11 years that he was engaged in his Nama Vrata, one of his practices was during the four months of Kartik, he would eat once a day. And that once a day eating was only Khetri with no salt. Try it. No salt, once a day, for four months. And so sometimes we see him with a, with a beard. That's because it was during Kartik month, because he didn't shave. And when he would have his one meal, the procedure was, he would eat, he would eat 
not with his hands, but eat like a horse. Meaning, he would lean over and with his mouth eat the kitchi or lick it with, with his tongue or however he would bring it into his mouth. And as soon as he would sit upright, that was it. Now what happens when you lean over? Your stomach shrinks. And when you sit up, you may still feel hungry. That was it. Once a day. For four months. Unsalted kitchen. He was capable of incredible austerities, obviously. That's, the, that's one of the points. He had control of his mind. He had control of his senses. He had control of his... He had control. He had, Krishna had control of him. His dedication to the teachings that he had received from his father and the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu were very, very special. And he lived according to the circumstances. The celebrated, here's a, the place, that now what it looked like, the rooftop where Chaitanya, where Srila Prabhupada first met Bhakti Siddhanta. And from the time today, it's about 104 years ago, 1922. Do you remember when he finished his Vrata? It was 2000, excuse me, 1917. So just five years later, shortly after he had taken sannyas, there was Bhakti Siddhanta on the rooftop in his, you know the story, a friend of Srila Prabhupada, because they were, he was in college at the time, said, come with me, I'd like, like you to meet the sannyasi. And Prabhupada's reply was, no thanks. And because when I was young, my father, Prabhupada's father, Gaur Mohan, he had a practice of bringing sadhus to the home regularly. And I saw so many persons that weren't really sadhus in the dress of sadhus. So no thanks. And his friend insisted, no, no, he's not one of those. This is the real thing. Please come. So to oblige his friend, Prabhupada came. And this is their first meeting. You've heard this many times. Most of us have heard this many times. As he and his friend were paying obeisances, Bhakti Siddhanta spoke up. You're educated young men. You're English speaking. You should take up the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and take the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the English speaking parts of the world. I mean, this is his boldness. Imagine the first time you're meeting an educated young man just before they even say, how are you all? And you're telling them what their service is. <laughs> Go to the English-speaking parts of the world and give the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now, Prabhupada was an educated young man. And he was a follower of Gandhi, so he gave a Gandhi argument that said, if we go to the English-speaking parts of the world, who's going to pay attention to us? Because we're subjugated by British rule. So first, overcome British rule, and then people may listen to what we have to say. And Bhakti Siddhanta spent 20 minutes defeating that point of view, saying, it's not, you know, Krishna consciousness is not dependent upon circumstance. And the urgency need is now and so forth. So Bhakti Siddhanta planted the seed for the Hare Krishna movement in this particular occasion. Here's one of his sayings. All those conditioned souls who consider apparent impediments to their happiness are harmful or the cruelty of the Supreme Lord see only the first move in the chess game. They're unable to foresee what lies beyond the fourth and the fifth move. So, obstacles come in the path of any plan. Live for a few minutes and you find that out. And uh, see, the, if the plan of the Supreme Lord, that a, a wise person doesn't just look at the temporary. 
It's a whole topic, the mindfulness topic. S stay in the moment, at the same time, there's a bigger plan. And it takes an intelligent person to do both at the same time. You know, Bhakti Siddhartha was such an intelligent person. Some years later, his travels went far and wide. He was in Dhaka in <clears throat> the month of January, cold at that time. He spent one month speaking on one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, not repeating himself any time through the next 30 days. And there's records of what were some of the messages that he spoke during those 30 days with the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. He was at this time preparing for the Gaudiya mission to go all the way to England. And what was delaying this mission going to England was Professor Sanyal, one of his disciples. Professor Sanyal was a professor at Katak College and very close companion of Bhakti Siddhanta. And he was the one who was supposed to write this two-part volume Sri Krishna Chaitanya, because the idea, Bhakti Siddhanta's idea, was if you're going to introduce the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, you have to tell in English who is Lord Chaitanya. So it was delayed. And so the whole launching of that journey to England waited until the book was published. But there's volume one of a two-volume, very thick book, uh, one part of that very thick book is some biography of Bhakti Siddhanta. So that was in March. The book was published in May. They actually arrived in London, and the first little center was established. And then they tried doing something also in Germany and came back basically unsuccessful. But he was not daunted by that. He still wanted this mission to move forward. Here's a little history of Sankirtan. Personally, Bhakti Siddhanta would go with his many followers, some of them sannyasis in this photograph, and grahastas and whoever, and go through the streets of Navadvip having Sankirtan. And some of the local people in Navadvip were envious. It happens if you become successful, there are people that will be detractors. They, decide, they had a plan to murder him. They went to the police, offered to bribe the, the police, saying, we're going to murder him. So please don't interfere. Here's some money. You know, it happens in Bengal bribery of the police, but the police refused. He said, he's a sadhu, we can't, we got bribed, we can't accept a bribe for this. So, they didn't tell the followers of Bhakti Siddhanta, but they warned them, watch out. There's some people who are envious of you. So as they were going forward with their son Kirtan through the streets of Navadvip, some dacoits who were hired to cause trouble for the devotees came forward with their weapons and so forth. And the first thought of the members of the Sankirtan party was to protect Bhakti Siddhanta. So one of them was a grahasta and he made a plan. Let's change clothes. I'll wear your sannyas clothes. They're about the same height and stature. I'll wear your clothes. You'll wear my clothes. So they went someplace and changed, and Bhakti Siddhanta escaped. And the police came out and caught the dacoits, and they were ready to, if Bhakti Siddhanta wanted to press charges, they would have, have put them in jail. Bhakti Siddhanta, they approached Bhakti Siddhanta, the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math, which is not far from Navadvip, 
And he said, no, no, that's quite okay. There was so much publicity. We could never have gotten so much publicity if it hadn't been for them. So we, I, I thank them for the kindness that they rendered in giving us so much publicity about the chanting of the Holy Name. So the Dakwaites were set free. Interesting. He gave some important teachings about the Holy Name. Of course, many, many, many teachings. Here's one of them that I like specifically. Harikatha is the Swarup Shakti of Harinam. What does that mean? It means that we worship Krishna, but we don't worship Krishna alone. We worship Radha Krishna or Lakshmi Narayan or Sita Ram. We don't worship the Lord alone without his Shakti. So similarly, the chanting of the Holy Name is the Supreme Lord and the Harikatha, that's the Shakti, the Swarup Shakti of the Supreme Lord. So they go together, just like in his logo. And this is the Bhagavat Dharma path. So we engage in Kirtan and Japa at the same time, Harikatha. Here's a, a, an excerpt from Chaitanya Bhagwat. One of the books that Bhakti Siddhanta wrote was an entire commentary on every verse of the entire Chaitanya Bhagwat. In Iskan, we're familiar with Chaitanya Charitamrita because Srila Prabhupada translated that into English. Bhakti Siddhanta took Chaitanya Bhagwat, which is another full life description of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and rendered it in Bengali. And here's what he writes in Chaitanya Bhagavat. The characteristics of Prahlad are described in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. The characteristics of Dhruva are described in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Sri Gadadhar Pandit Goswami was the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam and Sri Gaurasundra was the listener he intentively heard topics of Prahlad and Dhruva's cultivation of devotional service from the mouth of Gadadhar hundreds of times. Hearing it again and hearing it again and hearing it again and never tiring and asking to hear it again. This is Bhakti Siddhanta's explanation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's practice. Here's uh, Bhakti Siddhanta having a formal meeting with John Anderson, who's the um, governor of West Bengal. And the governor of West Bengal became a guest of Bhakti Siddhanta. And you see how he's sitting at a table and all the formalities of the British. And this is a close up of that photograph sitting with this important personality. Here's a close-up of the deities. And those of you who have visited Chaitanya Gaudiya Mata, Bhakti Siddhanta's headquarters, take note, it's changed over the years, but the principle during Bhakti Siddhanta's times and the four corners of the temple compound, there are these four deities or murtis of the four Sampradaya Acharyas. And it was a platform that he spoke about that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted two teachings from each of the four Sampradaya Acharyas in establishing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. And there's a whole, the whole it, it, it was a significant Per mission, part of his mission was uniting the four Sampradayas, honoring them and especially appreciating Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as uniting them. So here's the quick list and we're almost done. This is Madhvacharya. His initiation was in the line of Madhvacharya, but two particular teachings of Madhvacharya that are part of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. 
he gave strong defeat of Mayavad philosophy and the deity of Krishna is very special. The eternal spiritual presence of, the, of Krishna is there in his deity form. In Sri Sampradaya or Ramanujacharya's teachings, service to the devotees and the concept of bhakti that's unpolluted by karma and gyan. We're all familiar with these teachings. In Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's line, they're similar to, not exactly extracted from, but similar to teachings of the Sri Sampradaya. Vishnu Swami, the sentiment of exclusive dependence upon Krishna and acceptance of Raga Mark and Nimbarkacharya, the necessity of taking shelter of Radha and the high esteem for the gopis and their love for Krishna. So these are all teachings within Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings and likeness of the four sampradayas, which is a key. One of my god brothers, Purushatraya Swami, we taught together in Vrindavan. And he liked this topic so much, he spent a year researching, studying, and wrote a book on it. And it's just, you know, a piece of Bhakti Siddhanta's work. The four sampradayas, the lives of the acharyas, the teachings of the acharyas, and how they incor were incorporated by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. It's, it's a significant topic. Here's a painting of Srila Prabhupada with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur at Radhakund. Something that Bhakti Siddhanta did is he took disciples through the holy places of Vrindavan and others and explained where the pastimes in each of those places and so forth and so on. And this is a particular scene where Bhakti Siddhanta was with some disciples. At this time, as you can see from the painting, Prabhupada was a grahasta. His position wasn't the prominent position. He was just one of the grahastas in the, in the crowd of grahastas. But Bhakti Siddhanta was sharing some confidential things with him. One of the confidential things he shared is he had recently received as a donation a marble temple in Calcutta, Bhag Bazaar Temple. And very, very quickly, there was cause of turmoil within the Gaudiya mission because sannyasis were vying for who would have which room in the marble temple. So he confided in Srila Prabhupada, better than having this temple sell the marble and print books. And then he gave an instruction to Prabhupada, if you ever get money, print books. Buildings may come and go, but the books will last. Print books. So Prabhupada took it seriously. And this was by the side of Radhakund. Eventually, he one of the places of Bhajan that he established was at Radhakund, there's a small temple where a Pushpa Samadhi of both him and Bhaktivinoda Thakur were established. This is the sitting place. He had a very interesting chair where he would sit. And his workstation is on the right side. His walking stick and his shoes. The temple at Radhakund is called the Radha Kunja Bihari Temple. And this little, little map, it shows you where it is. There's Radhakund Shamakund, and it's a little bit off to the side from the main Parikrama path. Here's the altar. Radha Kunja Bihari on the right with Mahaprabhu. And here's a close-up of the deities.
this winter time. They got the nice warm sweaters on. And this is our last slide. One of the many publications where it gave short sayings by Bhakti Siddhanta. And we'll see more of that next week. God is the shelter of all. He sends many obstacles and inconveniences to those who wish for shelter under him in order to test their ardor and steadiness. So if there's obstacles that are confronting you or those dear to you, that's good. It's, you're, there's a personal loving exchange, at least for those who are engaged. It's not everybody, but those who are engaged in devotion, on the path of devotion to Krishna, those impediments aren't karmic. They're Krishna's giving one strength. We, we discussed this yesterday evening with the Chinese devotees. You can read Canto 10, chapter 88, text number 8, which says the same thing that Bhakti Siddhanta is saying. Difficulties come to give, give us an opportunity to not take shelter in temporary things, but to take shelter in these eternal. It's not a new idea. That's an eternal idea. And uh, it's, you know, it's enter, enter, entering into eternality requires having eternal principles that you live by. Now I'm guessing that I've gone way past my time. How are we doing, Premananda? Way past my time, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, but, um I think that we can take just one or two questions. One this, or two. Yeah, because uh, this being uh, glorification of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati okay. Thakur. You pardon me for going over time, but get excited speaking about Bhakti Siddhanta. Comments or questions? Thank you, Maharaj. It was very interesting and uh, I was totally engrossed in the Katha. I, you mentioned that he was not successful in England when he went to England. He was what? He went to England to preach. Ah. So is there any specific reason that maybe Srila Prabhupada, he left it to Srila Prabhupada to do that or something like that? Krishna had a plan. I was thinking if Srila Bhakti, when he went to England for preaching, he was yes. not he was not successful. Yes. So, is there any specific re reason that Krishna had a plan that Srila Prabhupada do it rather than him? I'm just speculating. Well, there could be more than one reason. I mean, the desire of Bhakti Siddhanta was the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The desire of Bhakti Siddhanta was the desire of his father, was the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, why was it not successful if it's the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? One explanation you offered, there could be other explanations. Here's a little anecdote. A Kinchina Krishna Das Babaji, you know, who, who, you've heard his name, deeply absorbed in the chanting of Holy Name, disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta. On one occasion, he was with Ban Maharaj, who was one of the persons who went to England, and Srila Prabhupada. There's the three of them in the room. And a kinship to Krishna Das Babaji asked a question. Both of you are very scholarly. Both of you are very good writers. Both of you are very learned. Both of you had a mandate from Bhakti Siddhanta to go to the English-speaking parts of the world 
one of you was successful and the other one wasn't. What's the difference? And they, they chuckled and, you know, then he gave an answer. He said, Bhakti, Prabhupada, our Prabhupada, had full faith in the holy name. And that made the difference. Of course, a kinship to Krishna Das Babaji had full faith in the holy name. And so maybe he was just seeing through rose-colored glasses. But maybe that was the answer too. There wasn't sufficient faith in the principle. There was endowments of gifts given by Krishna to make the mission possible, successful, but not sufficient faith. Because why not many places being successful? That their, their, their being successful or not successful wasn't deterring Prabhupada from doing what Prabhupada did, because he also had a mandate. And when, he, when Prabhupada started, there was nothing for a year. But he was very determined, in addition to having full faith in the holy name. So, there's other factors besides Krishna or Lord Chaitanya had a plan, Prabhupada should be successful, the other should be unsuccessful. That's a possible scenario. Yes, up front. Um, it's very clear that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, right from his birth, you know, showed that he was a one of a kind spiritual personality. Yes. The pastime of him taking sannyas, though, I am puzzled. Yes, Maharaj. And especially, you know, given the current it, it, situation. It, my understanding is two things. It was purposeful. For preaching, there would, respect would be given commonly, traditionally, for one who is a sannyasi. It's something like, the, the by the way, the person who changed clothes this grihasta that changed clothes with Bhakti Siddhanta later became a sannyasi. And that sannyasi became Prabhupada's sannyas guru, Keshava Maharaj, who became a sannyasi living in Mathura. And Prabhupada took sannyas from him. So the argument of Keshava Maharaj to Prabhupada was you were, you were given a mission, you should take sannyas. It will give you the capacity and facility, strength, etc., to fulfill the mission of, that Bhakti Siddhanta gave you. You should take sannyas for that reason. So, at least that's one explanation of why he did, because he didn't have to, he was already beyond, he didn't need something of this world in order to propagate Krishna consciousness in the world. But it was a principle that he accepted and by principle, others following him also accepted. And the method was unheard of. It's not you know, a, a principle based how one accepts sannyas. You sit in front of a picture and receive sannyas from the personality who's in the picture. It's, it's quite outside of the vidhis of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Which is, I think that's what you're asking. You know, why did he pick that? Because there wasn't someone qualified. There wasn't a sannyasi from whom he could take sannyas who was qualified. But Gorkishore Das Babaji, who wasn't a sannyasi, was fully qualified as a renunciate. Gorkishore didn't take formal sannyas, but he was totally renounced. So, that's the system that he used, the principle system, rather than the rule system. Unique. I think we're ready for the announcements. <laughs>